Good morning. morning. And welcome. It's good to see each one of you here. And we are making you most welcome in the Lord's name. Thank you for coming. I'm going to begin by using the words of holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Just before we turn to the Lord in prayer, I would like to, on the church's behalf, offer our sincere sympathy to your brother Ken Abraham and Carol and the family on the passing of Ken's brother Billy into the Lord's presence. He was in Dallas, Texas, and he was actually out visiting for a Baptist church uh, whenever he was taken suddenly to be with the Lord. So let's join together in prayer. Our Father, as we come to you today, we are a fellowship that has known much grief and loss. And Lord, we can see, of course, in all of this, your bountiful love and your strength and your comfort and your courage that you give to those who are bereaved. And because we have seen this and experienced it ourselves, we have every hope that as we turn to you in prayer for the Abraham family, that you will come to them in that very special way. Lord, we approach you as the holy God, and therefore all that you do is right and holy and just. And we have that great confidence in you, and you demonstrated how right and just and holy you are, even in the provision of salvation for us, people like us, sinners like us, who couldn't work for it, earn it, or merit it yet you provided it all. And we thank you for this, and we praise you that we can come in the name of the Savior who procured it for us, the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we come in his name, we know also that he went to the cross holy, sinless, undefiled, 
and yet he there became sin for us. He took upon us and was laid upon him the sin of the world. Father, we thank you that we can turn to you today with full assurance of faith and with great confidence that it is well with our soul. Lord, we also ask for help in this meeting. We pray that we might know the blessing of God, the sense of your presence that makes such a difference to us. Lord, that we would hear your speaking voice. Lord, that you would minister into situations that perhaps we are not aware of. There may be someone here looking for direction or leading or instruction, whatever it might be. We know, O oh Lord, that you are able to reach into each of those different situations with a word from yourself. Do that, we pray, by the working of your Spirit. We pray that this will be a Spirit-led time and that we will find ourselves being carried along with the unction of the Holy Ghost. Father, we pray that the Spirit will be at work in every heart, not only those of us who know and profess you, but those, dear Lord, who have not yet made that open profession, have not yet said, Jesus is mine. Lord, may your Spirit work in their lives also. This would be a wonderful day for not only us, but the very angels of God, if one were to come in repentance and faith. Lord, we come to you again uh, on behalf of all now bowed before you and pray that even those who need that touch and body, that you would come to them and, and you would raise them up and you would encourage them. And we pray, dear Father, that there might be a sense that the Lord is at work amongst us and that many testimonies will be raised up to say the Lord was with us. Lord, we think of our world where you've placed us. We think of our brother Mark over in Burkina Faso at the minute, and we pray that you'll really progress and further what he has planned to do. And may he even get more done than he intended uh, as he is visiting there. And Lord, we think too of the nation where we're citizens. We have the responsibility to uphold them in prayer, and we do. And we continue this morning to pray for those who have the rule over us, asking once again that you would reveal yourselves to them, uh, yourself to them, and that they, dear Father, would come to realize that there is a God with whom they have to do, and that we might see your power at work, even in the decisions that they make. Lord, we think of our children and young people. We thank you for them. We're so glad that they are now able to meet together in this building, and we thank you for the, the good things that we have been hearing. We just continue to pray for them and ask that you will bless them, ask that you'll bless also the schools they go to and those who teach them. And we pray in difficult times that you, O oh Lord, will be at work and that the progress we would want to see in them will not be stunted or held back because of the current climate. Lord, we are asking for things which are beyond us, but we are coming to you knowing that nothing is beyond you. And therefore, we pray in faith believing and in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, some boys and girls in here today, and that is good because I've got another show and tell with me. You like to see it? Oh, the enthusiasm's killing you, isn't it? I brought me wee... Paddington Bear case along with me today, but uh, that's about as far as the picture of Paddington Bear goes. I'm going to have to set it back down here now that you've seen it uh, and bring the items out because I don't think it'll sit there very well. What do you think might be in there? What was that? A toothbrush. <laughs> you trying to tell me something, Jeannie? <sighs> Any other? Marmalade. No, I keep that under my hat, <laughs> as all bears do. This is a wee case that has been rattling around, I don't know, many attics that we have lived in, or the houses we've lived in. It always stays in the attic, and it has a number of ancient and quirky things in it. I'm going to show you a couple of them here. Anybody know what they might be? Who said it? Somebody said it. New Testaments that was behind me. There you are. It's behind you. Two little New Testaments. 
The first one is from World War I. So it's a 1415 Testament. And the second one is from World War II. But not only have we God's word in the New Testament here, but we also have a message inside. And I don't know if I'll be able to read this one here from Lord Roberts. And I ask you to put your trust in God. What a statement. That went out to every active service person. And many of them kept them in their breast pockets of their uniforms. And the rest of it is hard to read. But that's a brilliant statement, isn't it? I ask you to put your trust in God. And then the second one is from the king. To all serving in my forces, my land or sea or in the air, indeed to all my people engaged in the defense of the realm, I commend the reading of this book. For centuries the Bible has been a wholesome and strengthening influence in our national life. And it behoves us in these momentous days to turn with renewed faith to this divine source of comfort and inspiration. Amazing, isn't it? I think that tells us how far we have gone as a nation when you think of the importance that was placed in the scriptures way back there. So when I think about those two little books, it makes me think, of course, of the message. Not only the message from these two gentlemen, one of them a king and one of them a lord, because we have a greater king and a greater Lord. And the message of him is in these little books, the message of Jesus. And it's a wonderful thing not just to have a copy of the message of Jesus, but to actually know what his message was. And of course, it's a message of love, that he so loved you and me, the world, that he came to save us so that we wouldn't perish but have everlasting life. So the first couple of items in my little suitcase speak to me about the message. Well, then there's another item here, if I can get it out. Anybody know what that might be? The medal. But does anybody know what's anything funny about this medal? Yes, there's, why is there a swastika there? Yes, it's a German medal. And, you know, boys and girls, during the Second World War, the enemy that we were fighting was the Germans. And they were awarding medals. This is the German War Merit Medal, not the Iron Cross. They were awarding medals to their people for killing our people. But do you know something that happened? Of course, they didn't win the war. Thank the Lord for that. But it didn't stop them killing a lot of people. And it didn't stop them getting rewarded for killing a lot of people. But the thing is this, it reminds me of a verse in the Bible that even people who sin get rewards. And the wee verse is this, the wages of sin is death. Through time, you know, people became ashamed of having these in Germany. And this one here may, mightn't even ever have been given to somebody. I have a notion this came out of a at an embassy that was bombed and looted and made its way back with one of our service personnel. But these were being given out as rewards for sinning. You know, boys and girls, if you don't trust Jesus, you will get a reward. But it'll not be a fancy mansion in hell, I can tell you. It'll be eternal death in that awful place. The problem with this, when I look at it and think about the people who got rewarded, is that they couldn't help that they were born German. And we have to realize that, don't we? They couldn't help that they were born German. And you and I can't help that we are born sinners. But then there comes a time when we have to make decisions that we are aware of. And I hope and trust today that you will make the decision to follow Jesus, 
to have him take all your sin away and to put your trust in him. Well, what else have I got? Uh, oh, I, the, the biggest thing, this is why the box is so big. It's not for those wee things. Is that there? Uh, this was my granda McKendry's home guard helmet because he was a bit too old by the time the Second World War came around to go and be of any use. But he was in the home guard. And do you know what that reminds me too, boys and girls? That nowhere is safe from the enemy. You see, it's all right, all the troops going out and fighting in France and in Belgium and all other places like that. But we still needed a guard here at home. There was always a threat that things would happen here too. You know, sometimes, boys and girls, you just think, well, I need to maybe watch what I'm doing when I'm at school or somewhere else. And you mightn't actually think that there's any dangers in your home. Let me tell you, there's plenty of dangers in our homes. And the old devil will still get in there the same as anywhere else. And we have to be on our guard all day, every day. And the Bible talks about putting on the armor of God and the helmet of salvation. We just can't take it for granted that because we live in, maybe in a Christian home, that we won't get attacked by the enemy. Let me tell you, you will. And it's important that you're always on your guard. What else have I got here? Oh, yes. Up there. It's just about holding together. Now, does anybody know what that is? These are all sitting with masks on. <laughs> and I'm not even going to try and model this because it's, it's rank. And I don't think the rubber's going to last much longer. It's almost completely perished. But it's a good age. It's a gas mask. And in the photograph, you'll see a wee cardboard box. I'm going to ask you now, does anybody remember these? Uh, there's a few folk you see, and they weren't born yesterday, and they maybe do remember the gas mask. You know what that tells me about, boys and girls? Not everybody was killed by a landmine or a bomb or a bullet. Do you see that? Gas mask, that was to prevent you from an unseen enemy. Can't see the gas, but boy, can you feel it. And the effects of it are terrible. Gas can't be seen, but it can be felt. And that's just the same as all the things in this world that are against you and me can't always see them. No, well, there's things we can see and there's things we can touch and there's things we can taste and we shouldn't. But behind that, there's a force that we can't see. And that's why we need another force to beat it. Do you know what that other force is? Another force we can't see. It's the Holy Spirit who gives you and me the power to live for Jesus every day. Well, I've got one more little item. And there it is. Who knows what that might be? Well, you're well uh, acquainted with bullets around here. <laughs> I'll maybe start wearing this helmet. It's not just a bullet. Because if you take the top off, you've got a little pencil. It's made out of a shell. And inside it is a little pencil. You know what that tells me? Although that's something that was meant for wrong. It was converted into something good and harmless and even helpful. You know, boys and girls, Jesus wants to completely change your life. He wants to make a real difference, and you will be different, but it will be in a really good way, and your little life can be such a blessing if only you'll put your faith and trust in Jesus. So I hope you've learned something today from Pastor Show and Tell. And I'm running out of junk, but it seems to be every time I go home, I'm going to find something else. So thank you for listening. And we're now going to sing 
You can't get to heaven without S-A-L-V-A-T-I-O-N. Keeping our seats. Well, we're going to turn to the Psalms again, and this time, number 37, Psalm 37, and it's a Psalm of David, and uh, although there's 40 verses, they're all quite short, so we'll, we'll read it through together. Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good, so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger, forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. But the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. The wicked plotteth against the just and gnasheth upon him with his teeth. The Lord shall laugh at him, for he saith that his day is coming. The wicked have drawn out the sword and have bent their bow to cast down the poor and needy and to slay such as be of upright conversation or lifestyle. Their sword shall enter into their own heart. Their bow shall be broken. A little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholdeth the righteous. The Lord knoweth the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time, and in the days of famine they shall be satisfied. But the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of lambs. They shall consume into smoke, and into smoke shall they consume away. The wicked borroweth and payeth not again, but the righteous showeth mercy and giveth. For such as be blessed of him shall inherit the earth, and they that be cursed of him shall be cut off. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. I have been young, and now am old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. He is ever merciful, and lendeth, and his seed is blessed. Depart from evil, and do good, and dwell forevermore. For the Lord loveth judgment, and forsaketh not his saints. They are preserved forever, but the seed of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land, and dwell therein forever. The mouth of the righteous speaketh wisdom, and his tongue talketh of judgment. The law of his God is in his heart, none of his steps shall slide. 
The wicked watches the righteous and seeketh to slay him. The Lord will not leave him in his hand, nor condemn him when he is judged. Wait on the Lord and keep his way, and he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. I have seen the wicked in great power, spreading himself like a green bay tree. Yet he passed away, and lo, he was not. Yea, I sought him, but he could not be found. Mark the perfect man, and behold the upright, for the end of that man is peace. But the transgressors shall be destroyed together, and the end of the wicked shall be cut off. But the salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble. And the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trust in him. Amen. We know that the Lord will add his blessing to that reading. I'm sure as we read through that there, verse after verse after verse after verse that you have known and that people have shared with you and that maybe if you ever had a promise box or a little calendar with a text below it, dozens of these verses will have been used because they are all so meaningful, aren't they? And they all speak into so many situations in our lives. But the overall picture in the context of the psalm as it is before us here is really David trying to get a message across to us. Don't get worked up about the ungodly. Instead, trust the Lord. Don't get worked up about the ungodly. Instead, trust the Lord. We're living in an age when it seems as if the ungodly have the true believer beaten into a corner. Now, this hasn't happened overnight. It's a war that has been going on for decades. And bit by bit, the godly principles that have underpinned civilized life and family life for hundreds of years, they've been dismantled. And in their place, we are being indoctrinated with a new morality. We as a society have gone from being upholders of the highest morals based on the teachings of the Christian Bible and being against the things that God describes as shameful and abominable to giving in to pressure from those who practice these things and having to be tolerant, the law being changed to facilitate that. But it didn't stop there. No. The same groups who practice these things that God condemns, well, they weren't satisfied. And through a program of relentless pressure, we find ourselves being compelled, yes, compelled to uphold a narrative of a new morality. In other words, to, uh, we are compelled to be forced to hold views that fly in the face of the Word of God, and the only alternative is to suffer the consequences. And we could easily fill the preaching time in this place, not only this morning, but for weeks to come, given examples of believers who have been targeted in just that way. They've been harassed for daring to have a conscience Godward. Some have lost their jobs. They've lost jobs in the career that they loved. In careers where they excelled. Teachers, doctors, CEOs, many others. Business people have lost customers. These are people who have contributed to society. Penalized because they hold a view that exposes the popular narrative of the new morality. Well, what would God say to us living in this very society in our day and generation? Well, as I read Psalm 37, I think he may well direct us to Psalm 37. Because we read there three times, verse 1, verse 7, and verse 8, fret not. And that idea of fretting there in the original is linked with burning or being kindled, being inflamed, being heated. In other words, we're not to get worked up because of evildoers. And if you want to put it into a nutshell, what the Lord is trying to get across, look at verses 12 and 13 together. 
here's a fact. Here's a fact for today. The wicked does plot against the righteous, the just. And he gnashes upon him with his teeth. You ever hear somebody saying, he nearly devoured me. Well, that's just exactly, or, or he tore me to shreds. That's coming from that imagery. But here's the, the way it turns around. The Lord shall laugh at him, for he sees that his day is coming. And there's another one of those phrases that has made its way into life since the translation of the King James. Your day's coming. There's that phrase. So God is saying through David, don't get worked up. Start seeing things in a greater perspective. It's a psalm full of encouragements to keep trusting every encouragement or bunch of encouragements that we read there. It's also paired with a contrasting expose of the folly of the wicked. The wicked is a term mostly used, but it's also speaking of the ungodly, the non-believer, the one who's against God. Maybe if you're here today and you're not saved, you maybe think, oh, well, I'm not maybe a believer, but I'm not against God. Well, God doesn't see it that way because as you hold out against him and continue to reject him, he sees us all in that particular condition as at enmity with him. Get over onto the other side today while you can. And this Psalm of David is different from many of his other Psalms in, in a number of ways. Although it's a lengthy Psalm, he doesn't describe his troubles. The only time he uses the pronoun I is in verse 25 and then a couple of verses farther on, 35 and 36. And he's just making a general observation. I have never seen the righteous forsaken or seed begging bread. If you look at the psalm that comes before Psalm 37, and uh, if you look at the last couple of verses there, let not the foot of the pride come against me. Let not the hand of the wicked remove me. And then if you go over to the psalm that follows at Psalm 38, these are all psalms of David. I'm sure they weren't written in that order, but nevertheless, they're psalms of David, and they've been placed in that order. And if you find the first verse there, rebuke, me not in thy wrath. So I'm making the comparison. These are things that we find in so many of his Psalms, but in Psalm 37, there's none of that. So he's not given us any indication of his own personal emotions. He doesn't say what he felt even when he observed these things. We are not invited on this occasion into the world of his feelings. We aren't given a description of his lowest moments or his mountaintop experiences or anything in between. When he describes the ungodly, he doesn't describe what they have done to him personally. So it's a, a quite a different psalm. What else is missing? Well, there's no references to Zion or Jerusalem, no references to the God of Israel, no references to the house of Jacob or the God of Jacob. So it's very general in that sense. And that has prompted some to say that it's more like a chapter from Proverbs than actually a psalm from the book of Psalms. There's no personal prayer. We don't read in through it here, I cried unto the Lord, nor does he exhort others to do so. He isn't expecting imminent deliverance or praising God for past deliverance. So it's quite a different psalm. And uh, well, we've looked at a number of psalms now uh, together. Uh, I hope, like myself, you have been encouraged by the fact that they're so different in many ways. There are ones that are very similar. There are even those we've looked at and they're made up almost exactly of two other psalms put together. But this one is that wee bit different. Well, how bad is the situation that David describes as he sees it in Psalm 37? Well, he certainly doesn't hold back in exposing the ungodly, does he? Verse 7, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way. Because of the man who bringeth evil devices to pass 
In other words, the man who plans and carries out wicked schemes. Verse 12, the wicked plotteth against the just and gnasheth upon him with his teeth. This is preconceived. This is intentional here. This is violent. Verse 14, the wicked have drawn out the sword and have bent their bow. In other words, aimed and fired. To cast down who? The afflicted and the needy. To slay such as be of upright conversation or upright in their conduct, in their lifestyle. You're a walking target today because you're saved. Do you know that? Verse 32, the wicked watches the righteous. That carries with it the idea that they spy on a surveillance that's in mind here. Aren't we living in a day of surveillance of the the righteous? I mentioned before, you only have to upload something onto the likes of YouTube and they're able to go down through and read the words that I'm speaking and, and translate that. And if they see something that isn't according to, as we've already said, today's new morality, you could be in trouble. That's a form of surveillance, isn't it? And yet, in spite of all the evil that is in the heart of the ungodly, David is also worked up by the fact that he sees them prospering back in verse 7 there. They prosper. They seem to be getting the upper hand. Isn't that true of today? Not only that, he goes so far in verse 35 to say, I have seen the wicked in great power, spreading himself like a green bay tree. The ungodly person is the kind of person who's getting into positions of power and influence. And that's the kind of environment that David sees this upright person trying to live in. A place and a time that has become hostile to the holy life, the separated life that God's people are trying to live. At least they should be. He's describing an era dominated by godlessness. Every weapon in the armory of the evildoer is used against the child of God. And David believes that in spite of all that, he has discovered the answer to surviving in this environment. And maybe that's an understatement. Maybe we should put it a wee bit farther. Not just surviving in this environment, but thriving in this environment. Well, as I've already said, it's a psalm of encouragement. And although we've looked at the bleak side of it here, we can also think of the many encouragements that we find in this psalm. Whether it's a single encouragement or a bunch of encouragements, they carry even more weight because they're set against what's going to happen down the line to those who defy God. But that's something to be left with God. We don't come to this psalm today and we don't take our encouragement simply from the fact that the evildoers are going to end up with the wages of their sin, as we've already mentioned to the children. We're not reveling in that because we could, can only say here today, or I can only say at least, there go I but for the grace of God. But what we can do is see that God is revealing to us that he will have them eventually dealt with by himself. What's our responsibility? Our responsibility is to listen to what David's giving here with regard to advice, to take that advice on board, to heed it, and by doing so, to be able to negotiate a path through the minefield that is called 21st century life. And while the benefits to be received from trusting the Lord, for us, most certainly can be and should be experienced immediately, there's, always, there's another prospect in view here. There's the prospect of an age to come when the ungodly will be silenced. 
and whenever righteousness will be the rule of law. David's looking ahead. He's encouraging the people who read this psalm to look ahead also and to see a bigger picture, to adjust their lenses, to focus on the ultimate, not just the immediate. And what does David see in the future? What does he tell us about? And he does this in a number of verses so that it's not just something in isolation that we could take out of context here. What have I in mind? Well, look at verse 11. The meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Verse 22. For such as be blessed of him shall inherit the earth and they that be cursed of him shall be cut off. Verse 29. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell forever therein. Verse 9, the evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. Verse 34, wait on the Lord, keep his way, and he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. He's using words like forever, inheriting the land, more, inheriting the earth, peace, and an absence of the influence of the wicked, and all of these are promises at that stage, yet future. And that would certainly be true of the earthly millennial reign of the Lord. As with verses 12 and 13, we can't see it now, but the Lord sees ahead and knows that for the ungodly person, his day is coming. But for those who are trusting in him, there will come a day that in the arena of the, this world where all of these agitations and difficulties happen, God is going to do something visible here. What a day that will be. The ungodly won't win in the end. And the upright can't lose. It's great to be in Christ. The difficulty is that it won't always seem that way. Verse 10 says, For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. And perhaps it should read, he shall not be. Albert Barnes talks about this. What place? Well, the place where he lived. There'll come a time you'll go there and he'll not be there. The office he worked in, the grounds he cultivated, you will not see him there. His seat at the table will be vacant. He'll be seen no more surveying his land. He'll be no more in the social circle where he found pleasure on the place of business or of revelry. You'll be impressed with that feeling that he is gone. Now that's going to happen to all of us if the Lord be not come. One day we'll all be gone. Haven't we had a number of bereavements? We had a funeral here in this very building on Friday and that morning before I came to the service I was told of another and I'll have a funeral to take this Friday. Time like an ever rolling stream bears all its sons away. They fly forgotten as a dream dies at the opening day. yet a little while. I wonder if you're here today and you're not saved. How long do you think that little while is going to be? It's going to live forever. Well, having used the certainty of a blessed future to take the heat out of the righteous believer's frustration David goes on to give them something positive to occupy their heart and mind in the here and now. This is the advice that he gives, a list of instructions, and most of them are found in verses 3 to 7. And really what he's saying is this, this getting worked up that you're going through, this becoming heated and frustrated, this fretting, This is paralyzing you as a believer. 
we always have to be very careful. Things will come our way. We will have difficulties in life. Life's full of difficulties. But as believers, we need to be very careful that we don't dishonor God in the middle of these things. And how would we know? What, what's the litmus test for that? If we become and allow ourselves to become paralyzed by things that happen. Don't let the enemy in particular paralyze us. Don't let them win. Don't give up. Don't give in to them. Don't be beaten by their tactics. And he's saying, this is how not only can you survive, but you can thrive. Verse 3. Trust in the Lord and do good. Now, these instructions are mentioned in connection, of course, with dwelling in the land, the end of the verse. And that might be a possible reference to the covenant God made with his people, which simply was, if you trust me and you don't go looking to any other idols or any other nations for help, if you trust me completely, you will dwell in the land and I will prosper you. However, if you forsake God, you will have to face the consequences. And of course, it was in days of compromise that God removed his protection from his people and left them to face the chastisement that was God sent, but it came through and willingly through God's enemies. Their only hope would be, of course, to realize and to repent. And there were times when they did. Now, having said that, the context here is one of quelling the heated frustrations and fretting of the upright. So, what he's trying to get across is the feeling of ministering balm to those agitated spirits, cooling the fires of outrage. So, the instruction to trust in the Lord is a response to the situation that has been created by the dominance of of the ungodly. Do you know what's sad today? Many professing Christians don't get outraged and frustrated and incensed by the immorality of the ungodly and how it's forced upon us and our schools and everywhere we look day by day Sadly, for many professing Christians, this sermon this morning will mean very little. They are living quite comfortably in enemy territory. You know what the Bible says? We are only sojourners. You know what that means? This is not our home. But it appears that it is through our materialistic attitudes today. Asaph, who wrote Psalm 73, he was frustrated at the prosperity of the ungodly. In fact, so much so, he even said, have I cleansed my heart in vain? Have I been walking this holy life and obeying God for nothing? When everybody around me seems to be succeeding and when they come to die, they don't even seem to have a thought about it or a worry about it. He was almost tempted to give up. Never think it's not worth it, friends. It is worth it. He's worth it. But here's the thing. We haven't got home yet. We haven't got home yet. If we could only see what's there, I'll tell you, our attitude would be different. William Booth said he would love to dangle his soldiers over hell for five minutes, and it would make them all the more fervent in their evangelism. But I think if we even got a glimpse of heaven, it would do the same, wouldn't it? To think that one day we would be there and stand maybe empty-handed, I think that would have the same effect. And the non-believer, the ungodly, the wicked person, they haven't 
met God yet. The ungodly person hasn't left all their worldly goods behind them in death yet. Oh, they're enjoying them now. That ungodly person hasn't opened their eyes in hell yet. Trust in the Lord. You'll never regret it. He hasn't been thrown off course by all that we see in our world today that's against him. Not one bit. And his plan for your life will come to pass. You need to trust in him. The wicked will have their day. Their time will come. They will be cut down like the grass. But what's, what are we to do? We are to trust in the Lord. We're also to delight ourselves in the Lord. Verse 4. Now, mistakenly, some people think that that means that if he will give you the desires of your heart, that if you're saved and you happen to come to him after maybe not bothering much with him for a while, and then you suddenly uh, think about him, turn up at church, say a couple of prayers that suddenly you're going to get all your wishes and it's like an open checkbook. I like this little phrase translated by James Hastings which goes like this. Verse 4. Delight in the Lord and then thou mayst trust thy desires. You get it? If you're delighting in the Lord then you can actually trust the desires that you have. Because they're not going to be against him. There's no way if you're delighting in the Lord and you're in that closest of uh, relationships with him that you are going to do anything that will offend him or cause him pain. You will not want to create a distance between you and he. An old man who went to church as I was growing up, we, we, we gave older people nicknames in church. Imagine, tut tut. But uh, some of the nicknames, and one wee man, he used to shout out number 45 when it came to the Lord's table. So for years, we just called him number 45. Was number 45 out today? And this other wee man, every time they asked for a course, he always gave out, I get so thrilled with Jesus. So we ended up calling him, I get so thrilled with Jesus, wasn't out today. But that was his favorite chorus. It's a wee bit like the other words of the hymn, all that thrills my soul is Jesus. We sing it, we say it, but is it real? Because that's delighting yourself in the Lord. Jesus first thought in the morning, Jesus last thought at night. Jesus my song all the day long. That's delighting yourself in the Lord. Commit your way to the Lord. Verse 5. Verse 23. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. He delighteth in his way. Verse 31. The law of of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. These are all saying similar things. The way. The steps that you take on that way. And all of these suggest to us that God expects his children to be going somewhere. You're going somewhere. We're on a journey. We are sojourners. We're not citizens here. Our citizenship is in heaven. And if we're truly on a journey, we should be making progress. And Jesus gave one of the examples. He talked about the broad road that leads to destruction and the narrow way that leads to... It leads to it's going somewhere. So much of the Old Testament involves people on the move. The Gospels are full of Jesus and the disciples on the move. The book of Acts that we are in, we're going to discover as well, is full of movement. Paul's missionary journeys for a start. How do you see your life as a believer? What are your steps like? Where have your steps taken you? Have you made any progress? Jesus, in calling his disciples, he was very economical with the words, wasn't he? He said, follow me. And 
he's someone who was always on the move. If you're going to have to negotiate or navigate the minefield of this godless world, Jesus is the one you want to follow, isn't it? Right? Then, verse 7, rest in the Lord. Now, this is not like come ye yourselves apart and rest a while. It is slightly different. There are times, of course, when that is necessary. But this is the picture of somebody being completely yielded, completely surrendered to a surface of some kind. And in mind is more probably a bed, a couch, a hammock. So you're sinking down into that surface completely. You haven't one arm or one leg propping you on the floor. You are completely, wholly and fully yielded and getting support from the surface you've yielded to. You're stretched out. You're resting. You're letting that surface take all of your weight. And that's what resting in the Lord is all about. Completely yielded to him, are we? Fully surrendered to him, are we? Wait patiently for him. Same verse, verse uh, 7. And also, verse 9 and verse 34, the same idea. Rest in the Lord, wait patiently for him. Lamentations 3 and 26. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. Are we going to follow those instructions today? Are they just so familiar to us because we have seen them on, on calendars and on cards and that we, it doesn't impact us anymore? Well, David sees this as the path through this awful, adverse world. So I think we should take these little instructions seriously and ask ourselves this in closing. Is the Lord worth trusting? Is he worth trusting? Well, the answer, of course, is yes. Because by trusting him, we will eventually see vindication. Verse 6, he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light and thy judgment as the noonday. You'll be vindicated one day. Then retribution, verse 15, their sword shall enter their own heart and their bows shall be broken, but leave that to him. He then can be trusted for support. The arms of the wicked, verse 17, shall be broken, but the Lord upholdeth the righteous. Verse 24, though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. We can trust the Lord for support. We can trust the Lord for preservation. Verse 19, they shall not be ashamed in the evil time and in the days of famine they shall be satisfied. Verse 25, I have not seen the righteous forsaken nor a seed begging bread. Verse 28, the Lord loveth judgment and forsaketh not his saints. They are preserved forever. We can trust him for preservation. We can trust him for peace. Mark the blameless man, the perfect man, and behold the upright, for the end of that man is peace. We can trust him for strength. Verse 39, the salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. He is their strength in time of trouble. And verse 40, we can trust him for help. The Lord shall help them and deliver them. He's worthy of our complete and full trust, no matter what is going on around us, no matter how bad things get, we can still trust him. May the Lord bless these thoughts to your hearts for his name's sake. Our last song is, May the mind of Christ my Savior live in me from day to day. And there's five verses, so maybe again, just the first and last, please. One and five, keeping our seats. <laughs>
Father, may we truly use this as a prayer today. May I run the race before me. Lord, none of us know, as we've used that little phrase, a little while, none of us know when that little while will come to an end. For those who aren't saved, Lord, may those words burn into their hearts this morning. And for those of us who know and love you, may we realize that we can only work while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. Lord, help us to be those who are on the move in spite of all that's against us. Lord, we're glad that we can trust you completely. Oh, for grace to trust you more. For Jesus' sake.